Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. <clears throat> title of my sermon is, What's the Matter? Okay, We're going to look and see uh, how to establish a matter. And when I say a matter, I'm talking about, uh, like in this passage, it's a trespass, an issue, you had a problem. Uh, whether that be at church, at work, in your personal life, right? We're going to see how to establish what's actually happened. We're going to see how to judge what's happened. And we are going to see how to make restoration after the fact. So here we see how we establish the matter. Say somebody offends you, right? This passage here, in verse 15, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So, Brother Adam offends me. It is not his job to come to me because he offended me. It is my job to go to him and tell him, Hey, look, you backed up into my van. Okay? Now, I've scratched my van, driven my van into curbs and all other stuff, but, you know, he offended me because he backed into my van, right? I need to go to him. <clears throat> and I do it in between me and him. I don't come up here while everyone's talking and I say, hey, you backed in. No, it's, all right. hey, Brother Adam, I need to come to, I need to talk to you for a minute, right? And then you talk to each other, the person you have a problem with, alone, right? Right? You go to them. You talk to them alone. And if he hears you, if he gets what you're, what you're trying to uh, you know, lay out, and he says, yeah, you, you know what, I did that, I'm sorry, you know, takes care of it, then there's nothing to, to go on about, right? We're done. It's solved. If you don't, right? This is how we establish a matter. One or two witnesses. Got to bring them before. You know, maybe you'd show them the vehicle, Show the scuff paint on his vehicle, whatever the case may be, right? Hey, look, this happened. You've got the one or two witnesses that say, yes, that this did happen. And they would confirm either, <clears throat> Brother Adam, you got to fix this. Or, Doug, no, that's not his. You know, you need to lay off. Whatever the case may be. There, the, the matter gets established, right? That's how we establish matters. By witnesses. By that's how the gospel was established. In in First uh, John, we read John saying, "Hey, look, we've seen, we've handled, we've touched, we you know we've we've handled the word of life, right. right?" Peter, we heard a voice from heaven, and they heard a voice from heaven on more than one occasion, right? right? Yeah. It was a witness. There were five hundred people that witnessed Christ as you know risen, right? Our gospel is established by witness. It wasn't, it's not Muhammad who gets an angel, him and, you know, this angel alone have this secret conversation and he just tells a whole bunch of new scripture, right? That's, that wasn't established by witnesses at all. And it's contradicting the rest of the Bible right. um, on top of that, Amen. right? <clears throat> but our gospel, our Bible is established by witnesses, and that's the pattern that God wants laid out. Hey, if you're going to establish something, it needs to be by witnesses. Okay? So, we see that. We see that it is established by witnesses. Now, we said, hey, if it's established, this certain thing happened, and now there needs to be judgment. Go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, By this pattern, we can judge anything and everything that might come up. But there are only certain things that God puts in the Bible as far as, hey, you escalate this. right? We saw that in, in Matthew that 
certain things get escalated to the church, right? And uh, the church here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, we read, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with the idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He's saying, hey, look, I told you not to company with these people, but I'm not talking about necessarily the people of the world, because then you wouldn't be able to go to work, or the grocery store, or anything like that, because they're all over the place, right? You wouldn't be able to talk to anybody. <clears throat> Verse 11 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Right? He says, hey, if you're going to escalate it to the church for them to be kicked out of the church, he puts forward these specific sins. He says, hey, if he's a fornicator, covetous, an idolater, if he's got a different God, right? Or if he's a railer or a drunkard, right? Or an extortioner, he's cheating people out of money, right? If he's one of these things, okay, kick him out of church. You know what? He, he did not say. He said, if, if somebody's a vegetarian or if somebody, uh, I don't know, does their hair different or whatever, right? Now, granted, I'm not saying, you know, men have long hair or anything like that, but, <laughs> you know, there are certain things that God is saying, hey, or, you know, Paul's writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, you know, these things kick people out for. Right? This is what gets judged. And it gets judged by the church. It gets judged by the congregation. Right? Kind of limits what they're allowed to kick people out for. But he's also saying, hey, look, it's the church. Uh, back over in Matthew 18. I'll, I'll flip over there. You can stay where you're at. Uh, but Matthew 18 uh, and verse 17, and it says, If he neglect to hear them, talking about those witnesses, right? We've established that you've done something wrong, um, and he neglects to hear it. He neglects to get it wrong in the presence of witnesses. <clears throat> Tell it unto the church. So at this point, it's been between you and one other, you and, you and the offender, and then it escalated to you and maybe two other people. So there's four people who know about it now, right? And if the problem's still not solved, then bring it unto the church. Right? Tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear, who? The church. Right? Not if he neglect to hear you, or if he neglect to hear one guy in the church, right? Who's going to kick you out. It says the church. Right? The church has to be in agreement, an active participant in the punishment. Right? right? The church shouldn't be told, Hey, by the way, this weekend I kicked out so and so from the church. That's not what it says. It says, tell it to the church. The whole church hears about the problem. And the whole church tells the offender, whoever, whether it's whether it's me coming to Brother Adam and I'm falsely accusing him, or whether it was Brother Adam that was in the wrong and it was the accusation that I brought, whatever the case may be, right? If whoever the offending party is, the church tells, right? If he does not hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican, which in that case means he gets kicked out, right? <clears throat> but the judgment is brought by the church. It's not brought by one man, okay? It's not brought by you going and talking to him. It's not even brought by the two or three witnesses, right? It's brought by the entire church, the church has to be in agreement. Not saying a unanimous vote, because obviously there are differences between people and some people don't see things the same way. But you should be able to get a majority that looks at something and goes, yeah, that's not right. You need to get it right. Okay? That's how you bring the judgment, and that's how it's punished by the church. Uh, turn over to Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Now let's look at how someone is restored. 
<clears throat> Galatians chapter 6. And verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, right? So we saw somebody who was the offender. He was at fault, right? He didn't get it right. Gets kicked out. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So we see here that, hey, there's some restoration. Right? And in 2 Corinthians, we see also a case of restoration. And in uh, Luke 17, the parallel to Matthew 18, we see some restoration. Okay? And, and here's what always precedes the restoration. Meekness. Not by the individual doing the restoring. It's the individual being restored. In Luke 17, it says, If he repent talking about the offender, forgive. Right? right? That's right. Okay. In 2 Corinthians, we're talking about someone who might be overcome of much sorrow. Right? He's, he is sorry for what he's done. He's realized his error because many people punished him. They kicked him out of the church. He realizes, ah, oh, I messed up. Right? He's meek. That's what has to precede the forgiveness. Right? And the reason why that is, is because you have to consider yourself. Why? Lest thou also be tempted. Why would you be tempted if you restored someone who wasn't meek, who wasn't humble, who hadn't <coughs> repented? Well, let's see. There's someone in open fornication in the church, right? You don't judge them. You don't put, or let's say we judge them. We put them out, right? And he says, hey, I want to come back to church. Have you fixed your problem yet? No. No. And you let him back in. You didn't restore him in meekness. What are you going to be tempted to do? Ah, well, there wasn't really any judgment for that guy. Right? right? So why, why can't I do it? Right? Because there's no judgment. That, that's the reason why the judgment's there. That's the reason why it's, it's so that he will be sorry, so that he will correct what he's done, so that he will receive that punishment. Right? If I spank one of my kids for doing something... And they, you know, they're not, they, they kind of look at me and huh, chuckle because after I spanked them, well, guess what? They're getting some more spankings, right? <laughs> the punishment's not over, right? Punishment is over when repentance happens. Punishment is over when that meekness, that humbleness takes place and they go, I, all right, I did wrong. All right, I get it. I'll stop. We're done, right? Because if you don't, then... The next guy is tempted to do what he did. Or the children are tempted to not see the seriousness of the situation. Right? The, those things, when they're judged, they have to be judged through uh, until that person is meek. Until we see that repentance. Until we see that, uh, you know that contrite spirit, whatever you want to call it, right? Until you see them say, all right, I'm sorry, I did wrong, until they admit it, right? That's, that's when the punishment ends. That's, that's when you restore them. Um, I had another thought, and I, I lost it, so <laughs> we'll just end there. We, we see that you have to, in a matter, you have to first establish it, Right? You can't just go off of one person, what one person said. You have to establish what the facts are. Once you have the facts established, you do have to judge it. Whether that be judging the one who was accused or judging the one doing the accusation. Right? And if said guy accusing is accusing falsely and he's accusing him of something that would get him kicked out of the church, the Old Testament says if you bring charges against somebody and you're a false accuser, you get their punishment. Yeah. All the way down from the easiest thing, which would be a fine, all the way up to death. Right? right? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be bringing accusations lightly. Yeah. Right? And if we bring accusations, you better establish them. Otherwise, there's no merit to your accusation. And once it's been established, you need to judge it righteously and it needs to be judged until there's repentance. 
And if you don't, you tempt yourself to, to fall into sin. And that is what the Bible teaches about judging matters and, and establishing them and seeing them through to the end. Amen. Lord, thank you very much for your word and just for the wisdom that's in it uh, to be able to uh, really just be able to guide our lives and be able to avoid the pitfalls of the world, Lord. Thank you very much. In Jesus' name, amen.